Grumman, my company, um, for the Human Exploration and Operations Business Unit. He's held uh, multiple positions, but most recently at Northrop Grumman, uh, he's been involved with the Cygnus program, the CRS program, as the Director of Cygnus Operations. Prior to joining Northrop Grumman, however, uh, Rick was, he spent 20 years as a NASA astronaut. He's flown three space shuttle missions, Soyuz mission, and was a crew member of two ISS expeditions, totaling uh, 227 days in space. He also conducted nine spacewalks. I don't know if that's a record, Rick, but it sounds pretty impressive. <laughs> um, he's held numerous leadership positions at NASA, including the lead for the Space Shuttle Cockpit Displays. Uh, crew, he was a crew office rep for the Orion Program Office, and he was an instructor, astronaut, and lead spacewalker on numerous space missions. So with that, let me pass it over to Rick. Thank you. Thank you, Sally. Great to be here. Our speaker today is United States Air Force retired Colonel Pam Melroy, who was sworn in as the NASA Deputy Administrator back in June. As Deputy Administrator, she performs the duties and exercises the powers delegated by the Administrator. She assists the Administrator in making final agency decisions and acts for the Administrator in his absence by performing all necessary functions to govern NASA. Pam is also responsible for laying out the agency's vision and representing NASA to the executive office of the president, Congress, heads of federal and other government agencies, international organizations, and external organizations and communities. Deputy Melroy's remarkable career includes senior leadership positions at Air Force, NASA, FAA, DARPA, and industry, as well as an advisor to the Australian Space Agency. As a former astronaut, Pam was one of two women to command the space shuttle mission. She served as pilot on two flights, SDS-92 in 2000, SDS-112 in 2002, and was the mission commander on SDS-120 in 2007. All three of her missions were highly successful, assembly missions to the International Space Station. I had the uh, honor to work with Pam for many years in the astronaut office, and I know we are all looking forward to hearing the NASA Deputy Administrator. So over to you, Pam. Oh, thank you so much, Rick, and thank you, Sally. It's uh, really a pleasure to be here today. Um, I'm uh, definitely uh, want to emphasize that uh, the Administrator and the asso Associate Administrator, uh, Bill Nelson and Bob Cabana and I um, are a team, and uh, all the updates I'm going to provide to you are things that we have uh, we have discussed often, and so I'd like to, you know, start out by saying it's been a heck of a couple of weeks for us. Um, we launched Landsat 9, sustaining the longest complete run of Earth observations uh, in partnership with NSGS. Yesterday, we transitioned our advanced traffic management program that we've been working on since 2015 to the FAA, which uh, they will deploy, saving millions of dollars, uh, reducing uh, carbon emissions, and hopefully saving all of us a few minutes of time and avoiding um, missing connections and bags and delays uh, for the aviation of the future. Last week, we held the NIAC, the NASA Innovative Advanced Concepts Conference, which is always exciting because we talk, get to talk about uh, thrilling ideas that are sort of the seed corn for the future uh, for our Space Technology Mission Directorate. And we also announced a reorganization of our human spaceflight activities to better position us for the next 20 years. So we've been a little busy. Um, for those of you who are not aware, uh, the key priorities of the Biden-Harris administration uh, relevant to NASA are climate, racial equity, um, uh, build back better on the economy, and global competitiveness. And we think NASA will play a key role in each one of those priorities. One of the other additional uh, things that the administration um, was well aware of and acknowledged is the importance of having a continuity of purpose uh, for our human spaceflight program in order to make progress on efforts that take decades to bring to fruition. So keeping the results of the hard work of the last decade was very much of a priority. And here we are, we're very close. Uh, we're about to see Artemis 1 fly, hopefully by the end of the year. In addition, we've got to recognize and acknowledge the incredible strides in output and growth in our commercial industry. 
which is the envy of the world. NASA spurred this innovation. One of the things that I point to was the intuition that our industry was ready to perform cargo services to the International Space Station with limited oversight uh, from NASA. Uh, this intuition came um, a, a long time ago. Mike Griffin was the administrator at the time. And uh, the amazing thing that happened was not only were our partners, uh, Northrop Grumman, SpaceX, and uh, Sierra Space is working uh, to add to those ranks right now, uh, they were incredibly successful. But one of the things that happened that I don't think anybody could have predicted was we were sort of getting into a death spiral in the space industry where uh, launch uh, was getting costly and therefore we put a lot of effort into our satellites to make sure they didn't fail when they got on orbit because uh, no one wanted to pay for another launch. So the satellites got bigger uh, and then the launches had to get heavier. And so we were sort of in a financial death spiral, but uh, this steady uh, manifest, this freight train to space opened up opportunities for scientific experiments, uh, for rideshare opportunities um, that have uh, really just opened up the possibilities for us. So it, it's really extraordinary if you think about what has happened uh, a de in just a decade. So about a decade ago, I was at the FAA uh, working on the first cargo launch to the International Space Station in partnership with NASA. And um, I was thinking a lot about the future of commercial human spaceflight. And I was pretty sure that we were going to get there for suborbital, uh, but I thought that uh, orbital uh, human commercial spaceflight was probably closer to two decades away. And as we all know, the Inspiration4 mission happened just a couple of weeks ago, far exceeded what I thought might happen in just a decade. For example, when Rick and I were flying, the shuttle and the Soyuz were the two human spacecraft uh, in the world, and the world relied on those two spacecraft to get humans to space. And now we have multiple vehicles for both suborbital and orbital capability. It's really incredible. I mean, the difference of what's happened in a decade. But an enduring challenge, which gets harder every single day, is how policy and law are keeping up with these rapid changes and growth, how we have shifted from only governments having the capability to go to space to commercial industry. If I can turn my eyes elsewhere, I can see that the specter of cybersecurity and privacy have dogged the revolution that the internet and key applications have created. So they've been amazing and transformed our culture, but because we didn't keep up with the oversight pieces, we are in a difficult place right now. Space really needs to be managed better than that. And it's e even harder. It's not just here in our country where we have to be thinking about those policies and laws. One of the things that Rick and I know from looking down at the earth from space is that the fallacy that what we do on one side of the earth doesn't impact the other side of the earth is just that, it's a fallacy. We are deeply connected and space shows us that and problems such as climate and orbital debris extend far beyond the borders of any given country. So not only do we have to keep up with oversight regimes in our own country, we have to figure out how to partner internationally uh, to continue to enable the growth of commercial space and yet also protect ourselves from some of the unintended consequences. Now, more than ever, as we and our allies and our competitors are pressing out beyond Earth orbit, we have to take action. The Outer Space Treaty is essential. It's very important. It's the underpinning of international law, but alone it is not sufficient. We just don't have global mechanisms such as the ITU for Spectrum that form the basis of agreements for cooperation and avoiding harmful interference to apply to those problems of orbital debris, norms of behavior for close approaches of other satellites, and other space traffic management issues. For, from my perspective, this is one of the critical at, uh, aspects of the Artemis Accords. It's an effort to step into that gap and begin bilateral discussions 
uh, starting with the things that we can all agree on and eventually evolve to more multilateral agreements. To me, the Artemis Accords is, is very important as a first step in that direction. Another priority from my perspective for NASA is in order to shape the future is to define an architecture for our investments that will get us to the moon and beyond to Mars and build it with our partners in industry and internationally. This investment in technology development for exploration is the fuel that will continue to grow our commercial space industry. We have to invest in technology development and then spin it off to industry and let them create new business models out of it. NASA's role is to continue to define the future and the technology and the science that we need to create that future and then fund its development as sophisticated technology leaders and open partners. The recent reorganization of the Human Exploration and Operations Mission Directorate, we believe will help bring a new focus to that architecture. The reorg also uh, will help us, we believe, to get to the next level in defining and supporting commercial industry so that we can commercialize LEO and see what the follow on, the commercial follow on to ISS is going to look like in the future. Of course, another critical aspect of defining the future is figuring out do you have the workforce to support that? STEM and equity are critically linked in my mind. I, I, I see this as something that we, we have to understand. We need the workforce of the future and we cannot afford to restrict ourselves to one segment or even just a couple segments of the population. We really need to uh, uh, continue to our investments in STEM and also link that to our mission equity efforts uh, to make sure we're reaching every single child in the United States and preparing them for the future and to be a part of the workforce, not just of NASA, but of, of industry. I'd also like to say that another personal priority of mine is program management and acquisition. 79% of NASA's budget goes to procurements. So we have to ensure that we're good stewards of the money. So we should be using acquisition approaches and technical approaches that reflect the challenges of what we're trying to do. We need to be creative and ensure that our contracts incentivize the right outcomes, both on the government and on the industry side. So that is a personal priority of mine and uh, one that is already underway as we're considering some recommendations for how to strengthen uh, both our procurement and our program management workforce going forward. Uh, I would like to just finish by saying uh, it's a very exciting time and uh, I am thrilled to have been honored by the Biden-Harris administration to ask uh, me to be a part of this uh, critical leadership team along with Bill Nelson and Bob Cabana and I'm happy to take some questions. Thank you, Pam. That, that was that was very interesting. So, um, in speaking about the future, you you speak about NASA defining the future. I'm particularly interested in where you see, with the growth of all of the spacefaring nations and the numerous commercial space endeavors, where do you see NASA's role in 20 years from now? Well, 20 years is easy because I'm thinking about it every single day. In 20 years we should be prepared to go to Mars. That's my, my sense. And, uh, but what does that actually mean? Well, it, it means we have to take lots of steps. We have to define uh, the architecture uh, for the moon, and we need to understand the traceability of everything that we are doing on the moon, both uh, to promote the sustainable presence of humans on the moon, but to prepare ourselves to go to Mars. So I'm really focused on that traceability and then the next step is to ask ourselves uh, how we should be working with our international partners to achieve that vision. So from, from that standpoint, um, I think uh, NASA will be, uh, will be very focused on Mars execution in 20 years. So I'm excited about that. 
Uh, but if you if you take that sense that NASA uh, should have a leadership role in defining what's next uh, and then uh, pointing uh, towards it and then working closely with our allies and partners in industry and uh, internationally uh, as how best to execute it, I think in 50 years, the conversation is going to be deciding where to go beyond the solar system. So speaking about uh, going to Mars in 20 years, and I certainly hope that's where we are, what do you think we need to accomplish in cis lunar space and, and on the surface of the moon in order to achieve that Mars mission? That's right. There's, you know, I can just tell you there have been tons of studies inside NASA and a lot of really, really good work. Uh, most of them tend to focus on uh, what I call the first of the four, what I call pillars. So the tech to support human life, right? So uh, we have to have, uh, you know, a habitation. We have to have transportation to allow astronauts to do science on the surface of the moon. Those are easy. Uh, we we talk about those things a lot. There's been a lot of studies. Um, we we definitely have to be working trades in those areas and what makes sense. But I, I also think we need to be focusing on uh, three other pillars. Uh, one of them is developing operations for a planetary surface. It took time for us to transition to really understand how to effectively use humans on board the International Space Station, because it was a very different model for operations than the space shuttle. So we need to practice. We need to actually get out there, get some experience and understand what operating for humans on a planetary surface looks like. How do we get the most out of the crew so that uh, we maximize their productivity and health? We also need technology to support science done by humans. During Apollo, we had a very limited view. We tried to get humans to the surface. We were successful. We got them back safely. We were successful. And then with the little bit of mass you had left over, you were handed a bag and a scooper to pick up some rocks. Now, the riches of the science that were brought back by bringing those rocks back to the earth are incalculable. And we have had so much that we have learned about solar system, earth formation, and the moon from those rocks. But we've advanced a lot in our capabilities. And if our ultimate goal is to do science on the surface of Mars, particularly to look for signs of life, we need to be really thinking about what tools do humans need to do science on the surface of another planetary body? We really haven't defined a lot of that yet. Uh, we, we could take the Apollo approach and bring everything back to study it, but I think we should be also thinking about what tools do humans need in situ on the surface and start to work on developing those. And I think we'll learn a lot from cis lunar activities. And finally, infrastructure. If we really want a sustained presence anywhere else in the solar system, we have to have the communications, uh, the power uh, capabilities, potentially ISRU resource extraction in a safe and sustainable way to support that, that long-term presence. And so we really need to define and understand how to build that uh, infrastructure and what it's going to take and what the best architecture for that is. So I look at those four pillars. We need to focus on the objectives that we would like to achieve. And uh, when we have achieved them, then we will know that we are ready to go to Mars. So I have a couple more questions, but I just wanted to uh... Offer up to the audience uh, the opportunity to ask your own questions in the chat box. You can start entering these now and um, get to your questions as, as soon as we can. Um, so you mentioned the reorg Pam last week that was announced. Um, so the the uh, announcement that we would be splitting human exploration and operations mission directorate into two. So the exploration systems mission directorate and the space operations directorate. So how do you believe these uh, two mission directors will help in NASA's achieving their goals going forward? 
So uh, the the thinking around this setting us up for the next 20 years has a couple of, of different aspects to it. We think, first of all, it's a reflection of the enormous success of the last decade and the growth of NASA's scope in human spaceflight. And as we are about ready to test out that capability, this uh, seems the appropriate time to look carefully. So just as in any business that's grown, you have to reorganize to reflect what you'll be doing in the future. So uh, one aspect of this is the scope is so, so great uh, that having two focused leadership teams on, uh, on problems means that we can get more attention on some of the challenges as we uh, begin to push out back to the moon. So that's, that's a big part of it is to manage the scope of growth and having two focused leadership teams. But there's another aspect of this, which has to do with uh, the fact that unlike space shuttle or the space station, we have had these periods where we've had a single monolithic human spaceflight program that everyone was focused on. It was a challenge for us while we were building the International Space Station, but after the retirement of the shuttle, we settled into another single monolithic program. We are not in that place right now. Not only do we have uh, SLS, and Orion, and EGS, Gateway, and a human lander system, what we see is a string of human spaceflight development including surface activities, Mars transport, Mars descent, Mars ascent vehicles that are stretching out into the future. This enables us to have an organization that is focused on development. Uh, the inspiration for this is looking at other organizations that have multiple development and multiple operations activities. So my experience in the DOD uh, was more on the development side uh, but we worked closely with our operations transition partners. And of course, as an operator, uh, I also was on the receiving end earlier in my career. So being able to focus on uh, development and then uh, as you go into operations and sustainment, uh, the contracting model is different. The oversight model is very different. And that will be the special expertise of the operations mission director. So I have one more quick question and then I'll, I'll pass it over to the audience. Um, so you mentioned in your opening remarks, the emphasis um, within both the administration and within NASA on climate change. Can you, can you update us on how NASA is contributing to the White House interagency group on focused on climate change and how industry can support that, those efforts? So the overarching big picture is that NASA is the eyes in the sky. Uh, the, data that our Earth observing satellites take is the critical information that decision makers need to have in their hands uh, to understand both how our climate is changing, uh, but also to be able to make decisions for what to do about it. And that is recognized by the administration, that important uh, role of uh, providing the data that's needed. So we actually participate in multiple White House interagency groups, including the National Climate Task Force, the Climate Security Advisory Council, and the Climate Innovation, Coastal Resilience, and Equitable Data Working Group. Uh, we also participate in the U.S. Global Change Research Program and the U.S. Group on Earth Observations. I'd also like to add uh, that we partner with NOAA uh, and our NGO partners at all levels to put practical data-driven decision support tools directly into the hands of those responsible for things like health and air quality, water resources, ecological forecasting, food security, agriculture, and disaster response. And uh, finally, I would point out that NASA is deeply engaged with the U.S. aviation industrial base, which is turning its focus uh, to building a green aviation system. And we are supporting that effort in multiple ways, including uh, aerodynamic efficiencies, um, uh, biofuels, uh, and multiple other uh, things that we're doing to support uh, climate targets for 2050 for aviation. 
So let me open it up to the audience and let's start with Ken Peake from Northrop Grumman. And Ken, if you can take yourself off mute and turn your video on. Okay, uh, I don't have video, sorry, but uh, I'm off mute. Thanks for taking my question. Uh, Deputy Administrator Melroy, uh, it's nice to talk to you again. I worked with you a long time ago on SDS 92, so uh, good to see you again. My, uh, my question, <laughs> thanks. My question is, do you, do you foresee NASA having a sustained lunar presence similar to, to some of the stuff we've seen for a sustained LEO presence with a commercial station, commercial destination, even as you transition out to more of a Mars focus? Um, the, the question is more in context of, A, the moon's a cool place in its own right, big place, but if you're commercial developing products and systems for, for the moon that may or may not transition to, to a, a Mars synergy, you know, what can you tell folks that are, that are working that, that angle as well? That's right. This sort of goes back to my views that the exploration is the fuel uh, that supports and sustains uh, a commercial space economy. So that's one reason why one of the pillars, which I consider very important, is infrastructure, because we know that infrastructure helps uh, support a commercial space industry. You know, we're starting from a transportation uh, perspective. Transportation is a pretty solid commercial uh, business case. Uh, people know how to build it, especially if you have a sustained manifest, uh, which we do, will do for lunar exploration. I do think that NASA will have a sustained lunar presence. I think that's very important. Uh, we will, there's no way we're going to get all the science done that we could possibly want to do on the surface of the moon uh, in, in, a, a de in two decades. That's not reasonable. In addition to that, uh, I think um, there will be other activities that we may be interested in partnering with um, and you know, building our scientific presence. I think it's going to take some time, but what what my view is that uh, that sustained presence, starting with transportation, but building with infrastructure, we will see. I mean, we already see it with CLIPS uh, that there is interest on the part of commercial entities and other governments uh, who are willing to pay American companies to get transportation uh, for their science to the surface of the moon. So we, we really uh, would, would like to see the moon become the next commercial LEO. It's gonna be further out. We're gonna have to, uh, we're, we're gonna have to see how that evolves. You can ask me again in 10 years exactly what that sustained presence will look like, but we do know our international partners are also very interested. So I have high hopes that that sustained presence will bring a commercial tail with it eventually. Thanks much. Thank you, Ken. Our next question is from Mark Bitterman. If you would like to take yourself off mute. Thanks very much, uh, Sally and Deputy Administrator Melroy. Um, I have a question about NASA's focus on hypersonics. Uh, I know it's a relatively small entity within NASA, but very important one, particularly in support of DOD. Can you talk a little bit about uh, the focus on hypersonic testing within NASA? All right, so uh, NASA, uh, in, in my view, uh, both from my time at DARPA and DOD and, uh, and in other places, uh, has uh, an unparalleled set of technical knowledge uh, and facilities around hypersonic capabilities. Uh, it's and that's you know not even even if I didn't count the entry descent and landing experience that we have on the space side. So uh, to me, you know, hypersonics is a very very important capability um, that that NASA has. Uh, we partner uh, with DoD. Our role is uh, more along the, the lines of the research and development. We also provide facilities that are world class and unique. Uh, to uh, to test uh, capabilities that uh, our partners are interested in. Um, from my standpoint, the other area that I'm really interested in, uh, I think it's relevant to the discussion today, is um, building a pipeline uh, through you know, STEM activities and partnering with universities. Uh, because you know, not only do we need a workforce 
there's a very strong growing industry that needs a workforce to support the hypersonic development that we're doing. And of course, um, we you know have key partnerships in those areas. Thank you so much. That that was great. Okay, let me pass it over to Courtney Stead. Hi, can you hear me? Oh, yes. great. Um, just so wonderful to have you, and thank you. Those of us who've known you over the years, it's just typical uh, Pam Elroy in terms of substance and and uh, value add. So thank you. I want to ask you about the James Webb. We're on the eve of that very exciting launch. And I wanted to get your sense of what do you say to the skeptical American taxpayer who might ask why the significant investment in the James Webb, why is it worth it, and, and why is it relevant um, to, to the public? Thank you. Well, I think the uh, the part that is, I mean, it, it, I am so excited about this telescope. It's it's fascinating. Uh, I, I actually one of the first things I did was get a big in in-depth briefing on the science uh, behind James Webb. And uh, the part that I don't think I fully understood is uh, some of the challenges that we have in looking deeper in time back to the Big Bang. So, um, you know, I studied planetary science, so I think I had a cosmology class, but we've learned a lot since I was in college. And so understanding the formation of the universe, there are certain epochs that happened after, after the Big Bang. And uh, things were actually pretty quiet for, um, you know, a couple hundred million years. And um, then activity began to happen with ionization and the formation of stars and galaxies. Well, it turns out that the frequencies that we can see these activities in are into the infrared, which is a hard place to look from the surface of the Earth because uh, water vapor actually gets in the way. So, although Hubble can reach a little bit into the near infrared, James Webb is essentially going back deeper in time. And we will be able to see the formation of stars and galaxies in a way that we cannot do today uh, because of the incredible sensitivity of the telescope to see these really faint distant um, activities. It's a keyhole back in time, which is pretty exciting. Because the formation of stars and galaxies is the formation of life. I mean, we are all stellar matter. Uh, and so understanding the history of the universe is absolutely going to lead to some really interesting and amazing insights about the formation of the universe. And more specifically, the ability to use James Webb to actually look at, uh, very carefully look at the atmospheres of the exoplanets that we've been finding is also going to help us understand those key markers that tell us about life. And I think, I think if you don't understand that finding other life in the universe would be one of the most revolutionary things that we could possibly do in science and the insights we will get about ourselves from comparing uh, to other life in the universe, I mean, this is a really, really important capability, and I can't wait to see what we find out. You sold me. Thank you. Thank you, Pam. So next question is from Myra Montrose. If you could mute, unmute yourself and go on video, please. We have Myra on the on the line. Can you hear me? We can. Okay, wonderful. Um, I I don't have video working. Um, good afternoon. Um, I'm Myra Montrose from L3 Harris, and it's so wonderful to be here listening to this great talk. Thanks so much. Um, my question is regarding the priority you mentioned on program management and acquisitions, and that is a really big task. And I was wondering if you have, um, you know, a list of your priorities that you're going to be working on to make that change at NASA. Uh, thanks, Myra. Yes, it is. Uh, but, you know, you got to remember, like I said, 79% of NASA's budget goes to procurements. It's our bread and butter. And it's more than that. It's 
actually achieving the goals uh, that we want to achieve in our partnership with industry. So uh, I take it very seriously. Uh, I could probably bore everyone to death with a lot of reflections and thoughts and things like that. that uh, but I will say that um, what, what uh, my observations at the, at the highest level are is that we actually have some really, really good processes in place. We have a NASA policy directive that helps us understand the processes that we go through uh, for program management. We have the NASA FAR supplement, which uh, guides uh, the overall uh, soup to nuts acquisition. Um, we, we, where we struggle is when we tailor uh, those requirements. Uh, we don't always take the time to think strategically. Um, I think um, in defense of many people who have had to make some pretty aggressive decisions to try to support a 2024 landing on the moon, uh, there what may, perhaps may not have been as much time um, to go through uh, that, uh, that thought process. I will also add that as we define the architecture, I really think we need to have an evolving, it, this will evolve with as capabilities evolve, but at least uh, some notion of what is the overall acquisition strategy for the entire architecture. And that means you actually have to think about disposal and end of life for a program. Uh, when, when are you going to be finished and what are the expectations? And this gets back to defining what, you know, what we hope to achieve, what our, uh, our pillars are for lunar exploration and uh, what those objectives will be. So uh, that's the way I'm thinking about it is I think we should be doing a little more work on the front end uh, in the acquisition strategy and having more robust discussions uh, that help us make sure that we have done, we are going to go forward with the right acquisition strategy. And then we have to lay in to make sure we understand what are the metrics we're watching for each program and how do they all feed together into a larger architecture. Okay, thank you for that question. So much. Uh, that was very insightful. Thank you, Myra. So let's move to Kim, Kim Terrell. If you could go on mute, unmute. Kim, if you're speaking, we can't hear you. Hi, good afternoon. Can you hear me now? We can. Very good. Good afternoon, Deputy Administrator Milroy. My question is, considering the advances that NASA has made in diversity to date, relative to the White House's objective of increasing diversity, what does that look like in practice, both for the current workforce as well as the workforce of the future? Thank you. Kim, thank you so much for raising this question. It's uh, incredibly important. As I mentioned, uh, we have to reach uh, every single American uh, and include them uh, in the discussions of what we do, but more importantly, to be a part of our workforce where their voice needs to be heard. So today, um, we're actually doing pretty well overall, although I'm a little concerned about our executive ranks in a couple of, of specific areas. Uh, one of the things that I'm excited about, to be honest with you, I mean, never waste a good crisis, right? COVID has showed us that, uh, that we can do more work remotely than we ever thought possible. And one of the challenges, I think, in the uh, population that is rising to the executive level in particular is uh, oftentimes it can be very difficult uh, to move your family to take on a new opportunity. And uh, that can be challenging, whether it's for uh, childcare or you know, healthcare uh, or uh, the support of your family or support of a community. So uh, I'm really hopeful and that our future of work effort is focused on uh, ensuring that we really understand how to open up and maximize more opportunities, especially at the executive ranks uh, for the NASA workforce. So that's that's uh, one area that I'm, I'm particularly excited to focus on. But I, I, there's, there's more that we should be doing. We have a lot of really great activities in our STEM 
uh, and in our uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion activities, and in the research um, initiatives like Aeronautics University Leadership Initiative, uh, mm -hmm. which uh, is, I mean, these are is space grants, um, a lot of these activities, but what we're not really doing is tying that directly uh, into our workforce recruitment. Uh, their, their individual activities. And so to me, that's, that's a really big piece is to make sure if we're out there working with a minority serving institution on, uh, on a grant and uh, developing capabilities um, that we are making sure that we're also targeting some of those students who are working on those programs as potential future hires. And I think it happens in an ad hoc way uh, but we could do a lot more. So I look forward to trying to bring all those things together. We have uh, an industry is a key part of, of all of that. Uh, for example, the university leadership initiative requires an industry partner. So uh, they're very excited about that too. Excellent, thank you. And I apologize. It looks like I missed a question from Marsha Smith from Space Policy Online. Marsha, if you would like to unmute yourself. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So, um, my question also had a sort of a COVID element to it, but it's in two parts. So, I'm interested in what the total cost to NASA is from all the COVID delays and whether or not Congress is going to be covering those costs or if NASA is going to have to defer other activities in order to cover whatever that cost is. So if you could just sort of put some numbers to that, you know, how many millions or billions of dollars is it costing agency-wide? But more specifically, I see that the Roman Space Telescope has passed CDR, and Paul Hertz said yesterday that it was because of supply chain disruptions from COVID, and now the launch date has slipped out to May 2027. Uh, could you say what is the cost increase just for the Roman Space Telescope because of COVID? And if I could just build on what Courtney was asking about James Webb, you know, how are you going to build excitement about another infrared space telescope? Right. Okay. Wow. A lot to unpack there, Marcia. I, I, I'm sorry. I don't have the numbers, especially around um, around Roman, but uh, long term. I think um, you've got to understand we're actually still living this. I mean, it's happening to us now. One of the problems that we've got uh, with nailing down our Artemis 1 launch date is that COVID has impacted Florida incredibly hard. And uh, as a result, we're actually real time seeing issues uh, that have to do with, um, with workforce, uh, they're not getting it on site. You know, we're, we have the right safety protocols in place, uh, but what we are um, what we are experiencing is that workforce that is uh, ill uh, is that or exposed then goes into quarantine, and um, it's it's anyway. It's this is an ongoing thing. I wish I had an answer for you today, but I think we're going to continue to see those COVID impacts. So, uh, the programs, there are individual programs. A lot of them have uh, given us reports about what they think the impact is. Oftentimes, the impact seems like it's around in the 30%. Uh, you know, I'm hearing that of, of some of the challenges. Um, where, where folks have reserves uh, or where they're uh, perhaps close to the end game, um, you know, you see slips that are on the order of, you know, weeks, like a you know, great thing was Landsat 9 launch, which was impacted by a supply chain issue that was directly related to COVID. So, uh, but we got Landsat 9 off. I mean, it was a little later than we hoped, but it wasn't, it, it wasn't, you know, months uh, or, or years. It's going to take us time to unpack all the, the impacts on some of the earlier programs like uh, Nancy Grace Roman. But I've taken a note. I will absolutely get back to you uh, with an answer about the, the direct impacts on Roman. And how are you going to build excitement about another infrared telescope after you've just gotten us so excited about James Webb? <laughs> well, okay. Uh, 
I have some more work to do there. I'm not as familiar with Nancy Grace Roman as I am with uh, James Webb. Uh, so I will get back to you on that as well. I, I think it's just important to remember that our uh, science is is really um, about following the recommendations of the decadal survey. The decadal process is a little painful, uh, but getting everybody together and setting those priorities um, gives us a lot of confidence that the things that we're working on are the things that we should be working on and what's next. So I will get back to you. I'm, I'm not as familiar with that, so I can't speak as eloquently. Thanks so much. Really appreciate it. Thanks, Masha. So I think this might be our last question uh, from Neela. If you could go on unmute and ask a question. Hi, good afternoon or good morning. I'm on the on the West Coast. Um, thanks so much for such a great talk. Um, the question that I had for you is also going back to the question, um, the issue of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, you had mentioned, you know, using data driven approaches to address climate change. I wanted to hear from you about your perspective on using those same kinds of approaches, data driven approaches, to address issues of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, and what will that mean in terms of sharing data? Um, Either publicly or internally with uh, within NASA's workforce. Oh, absolutely. Well, of course, we we have the uh, the FEV survey that um, is broken down in multiple ways. So I think we're actually pretty transparent about where the workforce is today. You know, the snapshots that we can get. Uh, this is a really important subject to the White House and. We have many, many activities at the deputies level that I am participating in uh, about diversity, equity, and inclusion for procurement. And uh, I think there are some numbers that have never actually been published that we're dis discussing, hey, we should be looking and checking ourselves on these numbers and providing that uh, information openly. We're still in the discussion phase for that, but I know there will be action. I'm happy to say we uh, also have a new position inside our diversity, equity, and inclusion office that is a data management position for exactly what you're talking about. Now, some of this is because people ask us a lot of questions, including the White House and Congress, and we need to be ready to answer them. Uh, but it's also uh, for us, I mean, we, we are scientists. If we can't figure out what the right questions we should be asking ourselves uh, I, I, you know, I think we can do that and uh, it, it's my intention that NASA will be a leader in this area. That's fantastic. Thanks so much. Thank you, Neela. And I guess I will close it out with a final question. Uh, you talked about growing the workforce for both NASA and for the industry as a whole. What advice would you give any young person who's interested in working in the aerospace field today? And has it changed since you started career? considering your career options? Well, it's changed a lot. Uh, first of all, um, uh, my role models were my parents because I didn't see any women doing the things uh, that I wanted to do. And uh, they always told me that I could do anything I wanted to. So I think we're in a better place now. We, we do have more role models, people, um, because if you see it, you can believe it. If you see someone uh, who looks like you in a position, uh, that makes a really big difference. I think the other thing is that I was hugely inspired by the Apollo program. And I knew perfectly well uh, that we weren't flying Apollo anymore and the chance to go to the moon was unlikely, but I wanted to fly in space anyway. And today, the number of options that we have are incredible, uh, especially with our growing commercial space industry, but not just with that, with the moon, uh, low Earth orbit, sustained presence, uh, sustained lunar presence, and of course the potential for Mars. Somewhere, I am convinced the first person to set foot on Mars is alive on the surface of the Earth today and is probably in school. Now, it's going to take a lot to put her there, uh, not just uh, the operations, not just the science and the exploration, we have to have the will. Uh, so many of you um, are involved in the running of your business. That's important too, we have to have that. I talked about the importance of program management. 
um, policy and law. All of those have to come together. When we talk about the Artemis generation, that's what I think of the, the whole generation, whether you personally want to set foot on another planet, like I always did, or to design a rocket that will take us there, uh, or design a satellite that will help us understand climate change, or if you want to work in other areas, whether it's arts, uh, business, uh, policy, and law, um, this whole generation, this will be their challenge. Well, I have to say your very impressive career and your accomplishments are certainly going to be a role model for people like myself and many other young females who are coming along and, and moving into positions in the aerospace business and, and into others. So really appreciate you talking with us today, Pam. It's been an absolutely fascinating discussion. And thank you so much for answering all the questions that were posed to you. Um, we are really, really happy to have had you here, um, and I really appreciate you taking the time out of your busy schedule to join us. So, thank you. Thank you, Sally, and thank you for everybody who took the time to join today. Uh, it's really a pleasure to uh, to see the interest in NASA and space.